today's scripture reading is from Malachi 4, 1 through 6. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble, and the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Daphne's our only one today. Well, I'll try not to be too boring, Daphne. <laughs> She's good. If you'll bow your heads with me, we'll start in prayer. Father in heaven, we do praise your name, Lord. We just do not realize the tender mercies that you give us every day, your grace upon grace upon grace. We realize it most of all when we think contemplators of our Savior. Lord, that especially in this time, help us to contemplate and marvel about what Jesus Christ did for us. That he gave up heaven, became flesh and blood, was raised by human parents to lay down his life for us. Literally, Christ came to die so that we could be, our sins could be forgiven and we could be adopted into your family. Lord, your mercies and grace are so new every day. Help us to realize that, to be a light to this world, to not complain and grumble as your children did in the past, Lord, but to, to realize this great salvation that we have and work it out with fear and trembling through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray now that you open our eyes and ears to hear what the Spirit tells us, to change the way that we think, to, that our mind will be focused on things above so that our heart becomes passionate about those things. Lord, that your will be done and your kingdom come. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So have you read your reading this week? If you did, you recognize probably from Luke that those words that Mark read were kind of familiar because Luke recorded the last words, literally, of the Old Testament. The last minor prophet, just because of the amount of words that he wrote, not minor in content or anything else, but the last prophet, last man of God that would talk to the children of Israel before it seemed like God had left them left them in the darkness rather than the light. Maybe for this point on, they thought that, hey, we've sinned so much, we've been so rebellious, so stiff-necked that God finally abandoned us. But you and I know that that is not true because we know the attributes and qualities of God, especially since He became flesh and blood and dwelled among us. And it's His will that no man will die in their sins, but all that will come to Jesus Christ. So the words in Malachi were the last words before hope came into this world. Hope through Jesus Christ. Hope that we have that is complete confidence in what we cannot see so that we quit looking at the things of this world and concentrating on them, but fix our eyes on heaven which we cannot see but know the reality of because Jesus Christ lives in us. He came and died and did not orphan us but sealed us with the Holy Spirit to guide us, to direct us, to reveal us in all truth, if we'll listen and obey. So you're reading First and Second Chronicles also, and it may seem like you've read that before because you've read Kings and you've read Samuels. Same story, Chronicles is one writing, but it's broken into two parts because of its length. You'll find some of the same stories that you found in Kings and in Samuel, but there's a different purpose here. The author is unknown, but don't skip reading this, okay? Because it is very important in wrapping up Israel's history and giving you another perspective. It's not, more, it's not as much as a character study 
um, as the other works that we've read. It's not so much of just a history. It's a promise that all through our history, no matter how stiff-necked and rebellious we've been, no matter how much we have loved the things of this world and committed adultery against God with our, with our heart, He loves us. Loves us enough that He would send His one and only Son, that He would die for our sins, that we would be forgiven, that we'd be redeemed back to Him, that we'd be given new life that the Old Testament talks about, that the Scripture would be written upon our hearts, and that the Spirit of God would be upon us so that we can be Jesus' hands and feet, so that we can be a royal priesthood. In the order of Jewish Scriptures, it's the last book of, in, of their Scriptures. A book telling the history and telling the future hope that we know that became a fact in Jesus Christ. The first word is, is Adam. It's the beginning. It's humanity as a whole. And the story of humanity that rebelled constantly against God. No matter how gracious, no matter how kind, no matter the laws that we knew were put before us, and no matter how much that we said that we would obey those laws, that we would choose life over death, we would choose blessings over cursings. But we still long for this world because we are all sinful and fall short of God's glory. There are none righteous, no, not one. So don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Think of yourself as a condemned sinner facing God's wrath that was saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wow! What a story we have to tell people at Christmas time. It is a Bible, it is a story of history, so we should learn from those, and it's a story of worshiping God because of how great He is in spite of all the things that we do. It begins, first and second chronicles begin with a lineage of similar like that Luke's does. That we can physically verify through history, through records and everything, that this is a true story, true people, and we can verify all that. <clears throat> the book ends with God's people in exile, and a new pagan king writes the last words, a decree. So kind of like the decree that brought Joseph and Mary to their hometown. A decree that says... Go back if you want to and build the temple. And if you understand anything about it, it's, it's an incomplete work. It ends in an incomplete thought or sentence. It's just if you want to, go. It's implied that you're going to go back to your land. It's implied that you're going to go build a temple. Now, as you think about that, I want you to think about your bodies being a temple and how Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. Something that the Israelites would never, ever, ever have even contemplated. It would have been totally sacrilegious that we will be God's temple. That He will reside in the hearts of His people. To be holy, set apart, used for God's glory to draw others to God through Jesus Christ. But the thing is, is who will answer that call? Who will go, and it's implied again that if you go, just like if you hear God's word, it's implied that you'll obey. If you go, you do. So you can't be a Christian who does nothing. doesn't work that way. Sorry. You can't have life insurance. But you can have eternal life and live a life abundantly because Jesus Christ said, I have come to give you life abundantly. And you can live for the things not of this world, but the God who created you in the first place and all throughout history has chose to keep himself faithful to you because that's who he is and to love you and sacrifice his one and only son to save you. Are you a child of God? And if you are, are you living by the power of the Holy Spirit? thing is, as many go, many say, many profess, but not many do. That's why on that day there'll be many that come and Jesus will say, depart from me, I did not know you. So we have our story of history, we have God's story. What is your story that he's writing upon your heart? And are you going and doing it? Your story's not over yet, it's not been written, and even though you plan your steps out, God has that story all prepared out for you if you'll just listen and let the Spirit guide you into all truth. So are you building on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ? Will your work stand up? Because everyone will be held accountable for the life that God has given them. So you began reading the Gospel of Luke. So turn in your Bibles to John. I love doing that to you. 
because we're going to look at John first before we look at, at, at uh, Luke. Give you some background. We've read John before, and if you hadn't realized in your reading, you're going to read Luke all the way through the end of the year. This is your last New Testament book you've got to read. There's several Old Testament books, and we end up with Malachi. So you get there by the end of the year. In John chapter 2, Jesus performs, or does, I don't like using the word performs, because it just sounds like it's for show. It's like we've, Bonnie and I talked before, I don't like calling this a, a, a platform or anything, I like calling it a podium. Just different choice of words. Jesus did his first miracle. And if you remember, he said, my time has not yet come. And you can think about what that means and everything. And as you're reading Luke, you've got over a month that you can read it. So you can read it, read it and also study God's Word so you're an approved workman who rightly handles the Word of truth. There's so much there, and I want you to think about as you're reading Luke, if you are a Christian, what Jesus taught you to do, to go and to do. Because if you hear His commandments and you hear them and don't obey them, what good is that? Your lips profess His name, but your heart's far from Him. So John chapter 2, Jesus does his first miracle or sign as John calls them. And John says specifically he's recorded all these signs so that you will believe. Not just have head knowledge, but heart knowledge. That's why you're to repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. It is now. A kingdom that we can't necessarily see, but a kingdom that we know is a fact because all of these unworthy sinners have come together with fellowship praising God and they're different than they were before it's evident they're a new creation in Christ Jesus so don't forget that and reevaluate your call to be a light to this world to be Jesus' hands and feet to go and to tell others about the saving grace of God through Jesus Christ what was the sign in John chapter 2 turning ordinary water into wine I say ordinary because we always want to add everything to water to spice it up and everything. But water is the essence of our life. We cannot live without water. And Jesus says in John that he is living water. And if anyone is thirsty, they'll come to him. Because if you're not thirsty, you'll come get a little sip. But if you thirst, you'll quench your thirst. You'll be refilled. You'll be revitalized. You'll be brought back to life. He turns water into wine because there is a marriage celebration going on. And if the wine ran out, the celebration's kind of a dud. <laughs> but the wine didn't run out, did it? And the wine wasn't, not only did it not run out, but it was filled in ceremonial jars, and we can go all down that, but I was not trying to spend too much time there. But there was time to rejoice, and it was the best wine you might think that the wine of the things you've had in this world are pretty good, but the wine that Jesus offers you is so much better. You can chase, chase all of these things of this world, but wouldn't it mean so much more that if you lived a life worthy and, and out of holy fear condemned the world and was a builder and preacher of righteousness and built an ark that your family followed in, which is Jesus Christ? Wouldn't that trump any other thing that you could have in this world? All the riches, all the success, all the power, everything else, to know that because of your life, your family followed you into an ark, which is Jesus Christ. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Throw everything else away. Don't let any sin entangle you or anything else hinder you. And we run this race together with urgency, with fervency, picking each other up, fixing our eyes on Jesus in the finish line. You have one life to live. You have one day less than you had yesterday. How are you going to live your life to bring glory and honor to God and to pledge your allegiance to your king, your savior and king? <clears throat> Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The apostle, the apostle John started his gospel off with that John the Baptist was coming and announcing that light was coming into the world. He who was, who always will be, who was there at creation, who everything in creation hangs and is built upon Jesus Christ was coming into this world as flesh and blood. And John the Baptist would be the one privileged to announce the coming of Jesus Christ. See why I'm kind of talking about this with Luke? Because Luke tells us more about the story. So I'll challenge you again as you're reading Luke to read any of the other stories that are in the Gospels just the same. 
so that you can get more of an insight on them. Like if you're right, reading about the young rich man that came to Jesus and asked how he would have eternal life, as you read the other Gospels, you'll find more about that, that man and you'll find more about the other things that's said. As you study God's Word, it's alive, living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts in and cuts out, dividing soul and spirit, teaching you all truth. And whenever you read, you'll see more truth every single time, especially if you're reading a love letter from your Heavenly Father that He's given you guidance how to live in this earth, and not just guidance, but power through the Holy Spirit. How do you think all of the apostles gave up everything? They never longingly looked back at this world. Their eyes were fixed on Jesus, and their mission was to tell others about Jesus Christ to the point of death. Man, what a statement. And what that tells me that I don't live my life even remotely like that. So it brings me to my knees to ask forgiveness and the power to live my life more where these things in this world don't mean as much, but my King and Savior means everything. After the miracle of turning water into wine, Jesus cleanses the temple. That's the next thing that John records. I already said I need to examine my life when I think about that, and there's cleansing that needs to be done. If you don't have any cleansing to be done, there's the first thing that needs to be cleansed, is that thought. <laughs> Jesus cleanses the temple, and they ask him, under whose authority does he do this? And his answer is this, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll rise it up again. Look at Jesus' answers when he's confronted, and you know some truth to that, but, but ask God to reveal more truth to you. What did he cleanse the temple from first in the first place? He cleansed it from hypocrisy and the love of money. Boy, that hits home. Because I say many things and preach it up here especially, and then I go home and don't live that exactly like that. That's a hypocrite. Wearing a mask up here, playing a game, an actor on the stage. Ooh, and I said this wasn't a stage. Because of the sin that's still within me that I do things that I don't want to do no matter how much my spirit wants to do them, the flesh is weak. So I have to have each of you to be in fellowship with. I have to constantly read God's Word. I have to constantly repent and change my way of thinking and ask the Holy Spirit to guide me into all truth and to listen and be obedient to His commands, not make excuses or anything else. And the love of money. They had turned God's house into a marketplace. Oh, well, I don't love money. Okay. What do you put your faith and trust in? What do you spend your money on? How much do we work for the things past what we need in this world, in this country? And then are we a gracious giver as a result, or do we go like the young or like the rich fool who built bigger barns to store his wealth? Are we rich to others because of the amazing richness that God gave to us? Jesus' answer was, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll rise it, raise it up again. And we know that the temple here that he's talking about is his body. Not a physical temple, but a place of worship because of what he has done with his body. He has gave up his body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. You know that verse. Are you doing it? You've got to let the Holy Spirit conform the way you're thinking. You've got to condemn the world and live for Jesus instead of living the way that you used to. The Gentiles do that still. Why do we still do that? True faith put into true practice so that our faith is not dead. Proper temple worship. In John chapter 2, verse 13, when the Jewish Passover was near, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and money changers seated at the table. It's the time of Passover, a time to remember that the angel of death passed over them because God gave them his grace because of the blood that was on their post of their home. And we're supposed to write the words of God's laws on the post of our homes to talk about it when we get up, when we go to bed, everything. Are we doing that? Has the blood of the Lamb covered us? Have we passed from death to life? And are we celebrating that life? 
Because in the temple courts, which was the outer courts, the Gentile courts, where most of the preaching went on, people couldn't get past there. We have a direct access to God because the temple curtain has been torn. We're not stuck in the outer courts. We're not stuck out there in a life that is controlled by money and things of the flesh. We can go into God's presence and truly worship Him. Verse 15, So he made a whip out of cords and drove all them from the temple courts, both sheath and cattle. He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To, to those selling doves, he said, Get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a mar marketplace? Now, if our bodies are temples, just like Jesus talked about his body as a temple, shouldn't we get these things totally out of here? And as you read through Luke's gospel, look for more ways where Jesus talks about a total cleansing. You can't serve both God and money. I know that's not Luke. <laughs> that's in Matthew. But the concepts are there. You can't serve two masters. Get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a marketplace? What part does light have with darkness? Verse 17, his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for my house will consume me. Do you have zeal for your father's house? On account of this, the Jews demanded, what sign can you show to prove your authority to do these things? Jesus answered, destroy this temple and in three days I'll rise it, raise it up again. What else did Jesus say about his authority? All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. There. Four, go and make disciples. Go and do. Verse 20, this temple took 46 years to build, the Jews replied, and you're going to raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. After he raised, was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. While he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the signs he was doing and believed in his name, but Jesus did not entrust himself to them, for he knew them all. He did not need any testimony about man. He knew what was in man. What is inside of you? What's in your heart? Has your mind been changed, or is it conformed still to this world? Do you truly believe? The apostles didn't believe at this point. It had to take further, further things to happen to them, but when they saw Jesus alive and walking after he had been crucified, that kind of changed things. And we know without a shadow of doubt, Jesus didn't swoon on the cross. He came in physical body form. He died and rose again. And that gives us a hope that no one else can have. We can think that, oh, that, that there's spirits here or this or that. But we know confidently that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And anyone that believes in him will raise from the dead and meet him face to face. So it should change the way you think and change the way you live. But Jesus knows what's truly inside of a man. He did not entrust himself to the many people that said they believed that day because of the signs that they saw. Because there was not a heart change. So what's inside of you? Is the zeal for God's house and his kingdom in you? Do you really mean it when you say, Thy kingdom come and thy will be done? Or is it something that you mean half-heartedly? Do you love the Lord your God with all? Jesus knows you inside and out. <clears throat> and Jesus gave you all authority to go and be like him in this world. He stayed 40 more days, Scripture tells us, talking about the kingdom of heaven. Not just talking about it because it's a place somewhere else. It's a people and place today living as Jesus Christ in this world. Bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth until one day it's complete when Jesus returns again and all things are made new. And before he left, he said again, he said, you'll be my witnesses. You don't need to know the times or seasons or anything else, but you will be my witnesses. So we get to Luke. He wrote Luke and Acts, right? So we'll just dive into the first of Luke and see what we're, what we're going to uncover. Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Many... We know there's four other Gospels, but there are many other people that wrote stories about Jesus. We have four that are accredited to, to the Bible for substantiality and everything. 
Four Gospels that made it. Matthew, Mark, John were all eyewitnesses, walked with Jesus, part of the 12 disciples. What about Luke? He had a good Jewish background, didn't he? No. He was a Gentile. He didn't have any of the background that they had. And if you read his writings, he writes extensively detailed with complete study so he can be an approved workman that handles God's truth correctly. He writes with detail and purpose, so don't forget that when you're reading his work. That if you read something and you see this, maybe it'll take a little time contemplating whether you get the answer you're looking for or not, or whether you think you've got all truth. Study God's word. It is alive and active for you. Many have undertaken to compose an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. So we see the relevancy of the Old Testament again pointing to Jesus. As the Messiah, the promised one, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Verse 2, just as was handed down by the initial eyewitnesses and servants of the word. The reason I told you look at how Luke writes is he doesn't only tell you that they're eyewitnesses. They physically saw, touched Jesus, lived with Jesus, but they were servants or slaves of the word of God. The word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. The laws and the promises that are in the Old Testament. Therefore, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seems good also to me to write an orderly account for you most excellent Theophilus. To who? Well, we don't know who Theophilus is, but if you look in Acts, it starts out the same way. We do know what the word Theophilus means. It means friend of God. Most excellent means revered, nobility. You know, you have to be born into nobility to be true nobility. You have to be born again, born from above, to see or enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm going back to John again. So who is he writing to? Those of noble birth who are a friend of God. Maybe he's writing to a real person, maybe he's not. But who he's writing to is those of noble birth, born from above, because now they are friends instead of enemies of God. Do you understand this? And he writes verse 4, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. So you know these things that you've been taught. So as you read Luke again, look at the things that Jesus is te teaches. And you know for certainty that his words bring life. Acts 1 does start off this way. In my first book, oh, Theophilus. That's an interjection. Oh, noble birth friend of God. Do you get it? Do you understand? And then he tells of the birth of the church, the power of the Holy Spirit that is promised in the Gospels so that you can live as Jesus taught you to live. In my first book, O Theophilus, I wrote to you about all the things that Jesus began to do and teach. If he began them, we should continue them, correct? If he taught us, we should listen. Until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them with many convincing proofs that he was alive. That's what he spent time doing, teaching about the kingdom of heaven and saying, hey, look, flesh and blood, I'm alive. Because you, you were dead. You, you didn't swoon. You didn't have to recover. You were dead, and now you are very much alive. I guess I can count on the things that you're saying. I guess you are who you say you are. I don't need to have to worry or doubt. I only have mustard seed faith, but increase it, Lord, so that I may believe more and live a life of faith. He appeared to them over a span of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Not something that we should take lightly. We should go back and read, oh, Matthew and Luke now because they both talk about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven over and over and over again. You'll see Jesus' teaching. The kingdom of heaven is like, and again, it's like. And these parables you're not going to understand unless you let the Holy Spirit speak to you. 
And even though you've been taught this parable means this, oh, there's so many meanings that that parable can have for you in your life. Verse 4, And while he were gathered together, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift the Father has promised, which you've heard me discuss. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But how many times do we not listen to the Holy Spirit? Do we try to go under our own might and our own knowledge, thinking that it's wise, but it's foolishness in the ways of the Lord? You should be prayerfully dependent upon the power of the Holy Spirit, seeking the will of God and being empowered by the Spirit each and every step so that fruits of the Spirit are produced, so that you walk in step with the Spirit. So when they came together, they asked Him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? It makes sense to us in our mind again. But Jesus replied, It's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority. So many times we try to study Scripture so much to find out the answers to this and that when we should concentrate on this instead. But the complete opposite, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. To do what? And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So I have to ask myself, how much am I being a witness Am I being a light? Am I being a testimony by the way I speak and the way I live? Or how many times am I getting distracted by the things, the loves, the passions of this world and losing focus on what Jesus has taught me over and over again how to live and the power to live it? I am writing to you, noble friend of God, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. As we read on in Luke, verse 5, In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias. So Luke has given us a real physical time that we can find in history. Zechariah means God remembers. This 400 years roughly of darkness when no one spoke to God through the power of the Spirit, no prophet was there. The darkness has been broken. Light is coming into the world. And Zechariah, of all people, should re remember this. That knows that God remembers His promise. He belonged to the priestly division of Abijah, the uh, true lineage here with true duties. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron, a true lineage again and true duties. And both of them, coincidentally, have that. When I say that, you know I'm, I'm kidding. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, not because of who they were, not because of what they did, but because they lived a life of faith. They observed all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive. And they were both very old. And if you know much from reading in the Old Testament that children are heritage and blessing from the Lord, and if you didn't have them, many people thought you weren't blessed. God's in control. He does what He wants to do whether you're barren or you're not. And He's a miracle maker and He can overcome any of that. So if you're barren, you should pray and pray and pray and pray. And we see that uh, Zechariah is in the temple praying. I don't think he's praying for that, but we'll, we'll read on and see. And you should pray with trust, total trust and faith that God will answer your prayers in His way, in His time working things out for His glory and His honor, but working them together for your good. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as a priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood. Not just a chance thing, not a rolling of the dice, but God spoke through, through lots in the Old Testament some. To go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense, to put that fragrant smell before the altar that would go up to God and... and he would recognize it and recognize that smell. Oh, that brings me to more scripture where our bodies are being used up and that smell of death that some people think that God is a pleasing aroma before him because we're giving up our lives to serve King Jesus. He has a once in a lifetime opportunity before him. Many priests never get that chance. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were outside praying, corporate prayer, praying for more than anything, the restoration of the kingdom of Israel, yes, but the Messiah who would come and do that. So we have some misunderstanding of how that's going to be because, again, we think a certain way, but God has something totally different planned out. 
but he still works all things together for good to those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. That exact time, verse 11, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him. An angel is God's messenger, okay? Standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Now here again, I'm not going to give you the answers, but Luke records you standing at the right side. That, that Luke could have left that out. It wouldn't have changed the passage any. But he put that specifically in there. So I have to sit there and think, oh, he's offering prayers for the people and Jesus is our high priest, our true high priest. It doesn't have to go in and offer sacrifices over and over because he offered his body. He's standing at the right hand of God interceding for me. And the Holy Spirit is inside of me interceding for me as God's child, teaching me to live as God's child. So I think there's some significance here of the messenger of God standing at the right side of the altar of incense, hearing the prayer of God's people. When Zacharias saw them, saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid because your prayers have been heard. Now you don't know what his prayers were again, but he's in there in behalf of praying for the people. I'm sure deep down there's a little prayer that he had. Man, I wish I would have had a son. Man, it's too late now. But he's not really praying for that because it is too late. Now, I, I, I don't think God's that big, do I? I don't think God cares that much about my little concerns, do I? If he cares about you enough to send his one and only son to die for you, he loves you so, so much. You are beloved and blessed because you're in right standing as God's child. And what good father doesn't love his child and give good gifts and will give you more of the Spirit if you keep on asking and keep on knocking? Your prayers have been heard. He should know that, that the angel is there to, to give him an announcement from heaven, and we get the angel's name in just a minute. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring many of the people of Israel to the, Lord, to the Lord their God. Now, Zechariah knows these words. Any good Israelite knows these words. These are the last words from Malachi that, that Mark read this morning. The last words. You've been concentrating on these words for 400 years, passing them down to your children. God will not forsake you. I know things seem bad. I know that it seemed like forever. I know that we're under Roman captivity now and everything, but God is, is kind, long-suffering. He is true to his promises. And Zechariah doesn't even catch this, does he? <clears throat> and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Are you prepared to meet Jesus Christ when He comes again? Are you living a life for Him or a life for the world? It's the history that we have all throughout time of God's children, and it still seems it's pretty much the story today, but there's a remnant. Where do you fall? Verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? Which is nothing wrong to say. And he follows it up with, I'm an old man and my wife is very long in years. That's why I, I can't fathom this. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel, the man or warrior of God. He's the one that appeared before Daniel. So he knew those scriptures too and knew, knew all the things that Daniel uh, taught there. He knew his name was God remembers, but yet he doubts, not in a way that's okay, but in a way that is, I doubt you can do that. I don't truly believe. We know he's righteous already because Scripture tells us, so he has the faith, but he needs a kick in the pants in his faith, doesn't he? Well, that reminds me that I need one too. Don't do it right now because I went horseback riding in my... Back part sore. <laughs> Didn't realize that two hours riding a horse for the first time would do that when I haven't rode in years. Telling on myself. <laughs> he knew all these things, but he lacked the faith which made it to the point of be, being a sin, doubting God. Sometimes we don't want to think the lack of faith is being sin against God 
But his word tells us all of these promises. Why do we doubt them, especially to the point that our disbelief causes our actions not to follow our beliefs? Hebrews 11 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. That's what the ancients were commended for. Then it goes on to say, by faith, and gives us all these examples. But in verse 6 it says, without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Now, Zechariah hadn't heard these words yet, but he knew this. And he, he remembered the believes in creation and everything, but wasn't concentrating on He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. He should have been out beside himself that he was going to have a son now. But instead his disbelief drew, drew him to the point of, of sinning. <clears throat> I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. Do you have the good news of Jesus Christ in your heart and do you proclaim it every time you get the chance? Because Zechariah didn't, and here's what happened. And now you'll be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. I love how Luke put that in there, at their appointed time. It's not for you to know the time or seasons, but if you do believe you've been born again from above and when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. If you forsake all and come and follow after me, I will make you into fishers of men, Jesus said. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed in so long because when he burnt the incense, he should have came right out. When he came out, he could not speak to them. So they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple for he kept making signs to them but remained unable to speak. Wow! To have the knowledge of the good news that he had. Not that he was going to have a son, but his son was going to talk about the coming Messiah that had been promised and promised and promised and promised to mankind. This one that would save their people from their sins, and he could not tell them about it. Wow. Now I've got to think of the opportunities that I have to tell others about Jesus Christ, and what if I keep my mouth shut? Why would I ever want to do that? Verse 24, after this, his wife Elizabeth became present, pre pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. Why did she remain in seclusion? I don't have the answer for you again. But I think one reason is because she wanted her husband to be able to tell the story. He was the one that the angel came to and gave the news. So for five months, she kept it quiet. She concealed Wow, because I kept my mouth quiet, my wife can't share the joy as much as she could have either because of what my lack of faith didn't result into a faith that was of works that I didn't believe and do as a result. Now you know what's coming up because you read it, I trust that you read it, is you know Mary's story and how she believed instead. Verse 25, the Lord has done this for me, she said. In those days he has shown me his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. But yet she didn't tell anyone for five months. Have I ever lacked the faith to tell the story? You know, today is the day, Paul tells us that, he tells that to the church in Corinth that he kept writing letters back and forth to. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 1, as God's co-workers we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor I heard you, in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor, now is the day of salvation. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path, so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, and Paul goes into the ways that he has suffered, and not suffered, to bring about God's amazing good news of grace. Everything in his life was bringing about the knowledge of Jesus Christ to people who did not know Jesus Christ. And then training them up to be disciples, not just telling them about it and then walking away. So in verse 13 of 2 Corinthians 6, he says, As a fair exchange, I speak to you as my children. Open wide your hearts also. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. 
For what do righteous and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? And I keep thinking of all the things Jesus said about being yoked together with Him and the things about letting the light in you shine. And if your eye is full of darkness, how great that darkness is. And I, I go all over the place studying God's Word to know what Jesus said to me. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For Jesus Christ gave me the opportunity when he died that the veil was torn and God himself dwells inside of me through this Holy Spirit. A temple, a royal priesthood. <clears throat> what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them and will be their, I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore come out of them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. After five months of contemplation, we don't know exactly what happens next, but we know in the sixth month, Luke 1 verse 26, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancies, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. Gabriel, we know, has appeared to uh, Daniel. He has appeared to Zechariah and now to a teenage girl. Maybe even a preteen. We think she's somewhere between 12 and 15 years of age based off of history of the time of being betrothed and so forth. Who in the world would she be to be the birth mother of Jesus Christ? Who in the world am I to ever be a preacher? Who are you to ever be whatever God has called you to be, to be a light where you're at? God sent the angel Gabriel to, a, to Nazareth, the town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Luke gives a different lineage here than Matthew. You'll understand that, but you won't necessarily know what's true, and we don't necessarily. It could be where the brothers have taken on the responsibility of raising up. It could be that, that uh, this lineage is from Mary and the other lineage is Joseph's, but we know that it's fact. It's traceable again, that you know this is a real historical account of a real person, Jesus Christ, who was God in the flesh, who laid down his life to save you, who rose from the dead, promising you eternal life if you would believe in him. Verse 28, the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Same thing he said to Zechariah. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Now Mary knew scriptures, but not like Zechariah. And she knew that the angel came, and she was gripped with fear, whatever it was, maybe in childlike appearance. Again, she didn't have enough thought process to be feared, but she was wondering what in the world was this. And she questioned. She said, how will this be? But not in a bad way. She said, how will this be? Uh, i am not been with anyone. I can't be pregnant. And the angel gives her the answer, and she accepts it. Who can be saved, Lord? If the young rich ruler that we've got in the different Gospels, if he walked away, he had everything. He knew everything. Jesus didn't even argue with him that he kept the commandments, that he walked away because he was a hypocrite and he loved money. What Jesus came and cleansed the temple from. If this man can't be saved, who can? Well, with God, all things are possible. With man, they certainly aren't. But with God, all things are possible. Will you just believe? So in verse 35... The angel answered, said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Mustard seed faith is all she needed. She didn't have to say, Well, wait a minute, explain this. I don't understand. She just accepted it. 
How would God ever love me enough to send his son and call me to be his child? And how in the world would you give me the empowerment to throw this world behind to become a preacher of righteousness so that that ark that I build that my son and my daughter-in-law and my grandchildren and my friends and whoever else I may encounter will know about Jesus Christ and make a decision or not to enter in that ark. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was unable to be conceived in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. Her answer back, I am the Lord's servant. May your words to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left. Well, we've got a character study here. Whose faith do you have? And all of your knowledge and everything of the Bible and God's Word, do you hold on to His promises? Or are they promises that you don't take to heart and don't live the way you should? All you need is childlike faith. In fact, Jesus said, if you're not that like a child coming to me, you won't enter into the kingdom of heaven. All you need is mustard-sized seed faith, and it can grow up to be the biggest of the garden variety plants where birds can rest and find rest and, and comfort. What does your faith look like? You've got five, six weeks, however long we've got to the end of the year, to be reading and studying the Gospel of Luke. To know that he wrote an orderly account for you so that you could have confidence in the things that you would believe. You know, without a doubt, we're coming into Christmas, that you believe that Jesus Christ came into this world, offered his life, and died and was raised again his sacrifice was complete, accepted by God. You have been justified of your sins. You've been sanctified, set apart, and made holy. But will you live a life that brings glory and honor to God? Or are there things that need to be cleansed from the temple, which is your body? As we read on and study, my prayer is this. That you study God's word so that it impacts your heart and changes your life. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for you are a mighty God worthy of all glory, praise, and honor. We thank you for your faithfulness. Forgive us for our rebellion. Forgive us for not working out this great salvation that we have with fear and trembling. Help us to look at the examples that we have before us. Lord, help us to realize the truth that's in your word. We don't need to understand them. We just simply need to believe. Just as a child who's throws her child, just as a child whose father throws them up in the air, they know confidently that their father will catch them and it will be the greatest time of their life. Lord, help us to fix our eyes upon Jesus, not to do our will, but to do your will, Lord. Forgive us of our sins. Let us lay them before the feet of Jesus so that we can serve him with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength. And help us to love others as much as we love ourselves. Help it to be apparent not in just our, our thought process, but in the things that we do. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.